Welcome to Lair of the Alchemist, where we discuss all things heavy metal and hard rock. For today's episode, I had to call in some card-carrying KISS Army members because we are each going to be listing our 10 favorite deep cuts from KISS. All right, first, let me read to you the Urban Dictionary definition of deep cuts. And in case you're unfamiliar with this expression, a deep cut is a song by an artist that only true fans of said artist will enjoy or know. True gems that are found later in an album, a B-side, rarely if ever played live or on the radio. All right, so let me introduce my guests. You may recognize these guys from our legendary Judas Priest Deep Cuts episode. What, you haven't seen it yet? Well, when you're done watching this, you have to go over and watch that one because it was epic. I had to bring these guys back. All right, so we've got from Wisconsin, Merciful Mike Smith. Merciful Mike is a concert promoter. Uh, he was the founder of the Days of the Doomed Fest and his, his concert promotion agency is named Merciful Mike Productions. Did I get that right? Yes, all right, awesome. Thanks, Mike, how are you today? I'm doing great, John. Good to awesome. see you again. Awesome, and joining us from Pennsylvania, shrouded in darkness, <laughs> the Darren McCloskey. Darren is the founder and drummer of the doom metal band Pale Divine. And Darren and I also have a Black Sabbath podcast called Into the Void, a Black Sabbath podcast that you can catch on all the podcast episodes, Apple, Spotify, etc. How are you today, Darren? Doing great. Awesome. Good to be here. All right. Well, let's lay down some rules first. All right. We are... Our 10 deep cuts are from the makeup era of KISS. So that's everything up to and including Creatures of the Night. We included the solo albums. Now, I read the definition of a deep cut already. KISS is a little tricky because especially in the last 15 or so years with KISS, with their KISS crews and their acoustic shows and the conventions, KISS is not afraid to pull out some deep cuts from their past and play them. So finding a song from Kiss that they've truly never ever played live is difficult. But like it says in the definition, these are songs that are rarely if ever played live. So uh, this is all for fun. If we pick one that you think is maybe not as deep as you would like it to be, hey, it's all in the name of fun. It's all in the name of rock and roll. So. All right, we're going to start with our first pick. We'll start with Mike, we'll go to Darren, and then me. So Mike, what do you got for your first Deep Cut Kiss pick? I'm gonna kind of start with an oddball one, and this was a period where Kiss was, didn't know which direction they were going. And I think a lot of people had dropped off, maybe a few people jumped back on, but I'm gonna pull out the Killers album. Right. And, uh, I didn't buy this right away. I picked this up, you know, quite a few years after because I had kind of weaned myself off of Kiss and moved on to heavier pastures. But once Kiss kind of came back around and I said, eh, I'm going to dig back into that, I grabbed this. And uh, my deep cut off of here is Nowhere to Run. I thought that it, the song was absolutely a real driven, driving song. And to me, it was one of the highlights of Paul Stanley because the guy is trying to shatter wine glasses in certain parts of this song, and his, his voice just hits those highs. And uh, I just always like the chorus to that, nowhere to run. It was just, it was a real cool composition, and then it was kind of an outside the box song for Kiss. So that one stuck out to me on the Killers LP, and I, I still play it to this day. Nowhere to run. Awesome. Who plays guitar on that? I mean, I know Ace is on the cover, but Ace was out of the band by then, right? So is that Vinnie Vincent? You'd have to ask Darren. I, I'm not exactly sure who that was. I don't, just don't remember it at the moment here. I know it wasn't Ace, and I know it wasn't Vinny yet, yet at that time either. I have no idea who it is. In fact, I don't even own that, um, at least on vinyl. I think I have a burn of it somewhere. That was, that was an album that always kind of confused me. I wasn't really sure what, what the purpose of it was. Um, there was some, I think there was a couple live tracks, previously recorded stuff. It was sort of half uh, studio uh rejects it seems like although you know the song mm -hmm. 
nowhere to hide is, is pretty cool. But it, I wasn't really sure what, where that came from or what the purpose of it was. I think it was only released in Germany. At the time it was, yeah. Uh, but the studio tracks, I'm guessing, were outtakes from probably the Elder Sessions, at least the one I think that, that you were talking about. So I think Ace did play on most of the Elder memory serves um ace was definitely on there and i i can't confirm this but i thought bob kulik played yeah i'm looking it bob up right kulik. now on wikipedia and it's bob it's bob kulik it is bob kulik. on the okay. studio okay. yeah on the studio guess. songs yep yeah cool yeah that's a good one i was hoping somebody would pick something from uh <laughs> from that album all right what do you got darren for your first pick okay uh first album just about every song we've heard thousands of times, if not more. Um, actually, I think uh, most of the of the songs on Kiss Alive really came to light. When it came to life on Kiss Alive, uh, the live versions, which were actually in the studio, but for all intents and purposes, the live versions on Alive of the cuts from the first album, the majority of the first album is on Kiss Alive, except let me know and that's going to be my pick uh not because it's such a great song but mostly because of the coda the end of that where the song you know it kind of trails off into that almost like barbershop quartet acapella part and then you know it comes in with that riff by ace and uh that that coda part actually ended up at the end of she on kiss alive and i think before that they would throw it in at the end of watching you when they would perform it live so if we're going from records uh i'm gonna go with let me know basically because of the code of that last part I mean, you guys know what i'm talking about yeah that was always the same way into ace's big solo yeah yeah yep yeah so cool pick good good pick yeah nice all right uh my first pick from the studio side of alive 2 i picked larger than life i've always dug it's got that big drum beat in it it's got sort of that stop and start guitar thing i love when gene sings it's sort of in his lower register you know, it is, if you want, make believe. <laughs> and it's got that sort of funky little basing. Ba -da -da. He plays that little bass line up high. And my favorite part in the song is it's right after the, uh, it's, it's after the first bridge there. It doesn't go into the chorus. It goes, it goes back into the verse. So it's doing the, it uh, goes back into that da 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 da. And G goes, Ooh. <laughs> he just sleeps out this really loud. Da 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 da. Ooh. <laughs> much too much. <laughs> I just think that's that good, man. That was good. <laughs> I just think that's great, and I love when Gene. I have a, I, of course, I have some, uh, you know, some other Gene songs on my list. I love when Gene sings about himself. You know, when it sounds like he's like talking most of the time. <laughs> yeah, we just most of the time, right? But he just has such a, you know, I don't know. He just does it, does it so well. And I just think the drums sound great on that song. And yeah. and that is uh, Bob Kulik on lead guitar, and Gene played the rhythm guitar on oh, that song. So okay. there's no Ace that. on that song at yeah. all. I think the only song Ace played on uh, the studio tracks on Live Two is um, Rocket Ride. Yeah. It's funny. I saw an interview with Bob Kulik and, and, and the interviewer asked him like, well, did you have to, he was talking about the side two of Alive 2, Alive 2. And he's like, did you have to like do it in secret? You know, did you ever run into Ace and was there like a conflict because you were playing Ace? He's like, are you kidding me? He goes, I recorded his parts and I came walking out of, uh, of the, uh, the engineering room and Ace was sitting there on the sofa out in the lounge. And he goes, he goes, Ace looked at me and he went, how did I sound, Bobby? <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, Ace, you never sounded better. <laughs> Ace knew I was doing it. <laughs> I guess he got, at the end of the day, I guess everybody got paid. There was a lot of money running through that. 
through that band. So, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, Mike, what do you got for your number two pick? All right, number two, we're going to visit the Dress to Kill album. And this was, uh, if I am correct here, this was a leftover Wicked Lester track, but uh, Love Her All I Can. Mm, yeah, and my I pick like it. Well. Uh, what's that, Darren? Yeah, that was my pick as well. Oh, okay, <laughs> so. okay. Yeah, you know what? I just like how the verses are, are more harmonized than anything else. You know, you've got that that harmonization doing through the verses. It's got that dry, that dun 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 you know, the way that Gene drives that song and everything. But um, I had the, the Wicked Lester demos for a long time. Um, I, I can see where it's, it's segued to fit the Kiss Arena more than what was going on back then. So I like the way that it was kind of, you know, remade. You're able to take those two pieces and compare them together. But, um, yeah, Lover All I Can is just, it's just a good, another awesome driving song. You can't see it in the reflection there. What is that? Yeah, that this is. Oh, there they are. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wicked List, Wicked Lester, and Progeny demo sessions. Nice. Uh, Didn't they release a lot of that stuff on that massive box set that they put out so many, so many, not that long ago? Yeah, they did. It's like a box set that had a bunch of demos on it, and. Yeah. Those have been floating around in bootleg versions for a yeah. while, so. Actually, Lover All I Can isn't on here. Really? No. I have the CD, and I, I'm almost positive it's on there. Somebody will correct me on this video at a later date. <laughs> Down in the comments. Get on them, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, it's still my pick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Darren, what do you got for number two? Uh, number two. Uh, I have All the Way from Hotter Than Hell. To my knowledge, I don't think they've ever played that live. And I, I thought that was a great, great song. It opens up side two really cool. It's, it's got a great chorus. You know, it's one of those Kiss songs that just uh, gets stuck in your head. You know, pop, good pop rock song. And, you know, I like, uh, I like Peter's drumming on that. You know, I, actually, Peter was, you know, in the first three albums, I think his drumming was, was really good. I, I don't think it was until later. I mean, maybe in probably much the same way that Ace sort of degenerated as time went on. I think Peter's drumming also did too. But uh, no question. yeah, I mean, I like the drumming. I, I like the song and I think it's really cool. And I'm kind of surprised that that wasn't one of the ones they pulled off of uh, Hotter Than Hell and put on or, or performed live on a regular basis because it's a good tune. Yeah. I had actually picked that one too. That was a really good song. All right. My number two pick from Rock and Roll Over, Baby Driver. Yeah, all right. Some Peter, some love. <laughs> Peter, yeah, Peter's got a fun voice, right? I like when Peter does the more, slight, you know, it's a slightly more aggressive uh, type of thing for him. And I, I love the groove of it, the whole like, ba, 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 go, baby driver. And then the part, gonna let you in, let you in, let yeah, you in. That, that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that echoey thing, thing is, is really cool. And at the end of the song, he's just sort of like, ah, like as the song's <laughs> fading out, he's just sort of screaming and, and going crazy. So, so this was actually the first Kiss album I, I bought. And uh, I like I loved every song on that album, except for Baby Driver. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as, I, as soon as I heard the, the, the first couple seconds of Baby Driver, I'd lift the needle, flip the record over. <laughs> that would be inside <laughs> one. But over time, in the last like 15 years or so, I mean, I've really, really gotten to like it. It's cool. In fact, it's probably one of the, it, they'd always throw a Peter Chris song on an album, um, you know, other than like Black Diamond, which is actually a Paul Stanley song, but Peter Chris sang the majority of it. But when I'm saying uh, Peter Chris song, I'm talking about like Dirty Living or something, something really yeah. lame like that. <laughs> uh, but Baby Driver is definitely different from uh, all the other songs on the album. But uh, it, for me, it was an acquired taste, but I, I, I really like it a lot now. I think it's a pretty strong song. Cool. Yeah. All right. Number three. The Destroyer album. Uh, much like the self-titled debut, they continuously play a ton of songs off of here. But um, my deep cut from this one, maybe oddly enough, is Great Expectations. Cool. And um, I don't know, when I was a kid, 
uh, Rock and Roll Over was actually the first one that I got, and then I got this shortly after. But listening to that song and the way that, that Gene goes through it, and you know, he's like, you watch me playing guitar, and you see what my fingers can do. You know, I didn't really get the sexual innuendos at that age so much. <laughs> to me, it was like, oh, this is really what like a big Kiss rock concert's all about. So I used to sit and listen to this song and stare at, you know, the inside or the cover of Alive. And to me, that described exactly what was going on at a Kiss concert. So that song stuck with me forever, you know, to this day. Even when I'm listening to, uh, you know, Destroyer, if it happens to be in the car, sometimes I'll just skip right over to Great Expectations. You know, and I like, you know, the choral parts at the end, just the arrangement of that song. Again, that was another you know, taken out of context of, of what everybody knows about Kiss. It's just, just such a different song. So, and that has a lot to do with uh, Bob Ezrin, Bob Very Ezrin's kind. production on that record. And I, if, if you listen to like uh, Billion Dollar Babies, which Bob Ezrin also yep. produced, you'll hear, you'll hear what Bob added to Destroyer, which is all those strings and chimes and oh, the the orchestral massive yeah. type things and uh you know he that's that's really like like bob's thing and it's it's a quirky song it's got some weird like chord changes and stuff like that and it's in the songwriting credit because that was also on my list uh <laughs> the song because this is so I, I researched it it, it is a, a simmons and ezrin song so it was yep. a co-write between the two of them yeah, Bob Ever Ezrin was pretty heavy-handed with Destroyer, and in, in a lot of ways, I I, I wish he, he wasn't as uh, as involved with everything you just mentioned. You know, the album is is like a, very cinematic. I, I would have preferred probably like an Eddie Kramer production on Destroyer. I, I think it's a little bit too bloated overall. I mean, there's some great songs on it, but I think it's I think it's really encumbered by the uh, the production side of it, you know, with the chorus and the strings and the sound effects in the background and all the bells and whistles. I mean, I think it's just, uh, as a kid, I liked it because it was like listening to a movie, you know, and of course, Kiss uh, was appealing in the sense that they were like superheroes. So this album was like basically listening to a cartoon. As I got older and became more appreciative of like the, you know, basic Eddie Kramer, you know, studio, everything up front, mixed well, very audible. Um, I, I kind of wish that I, I could hear those Destroyer songs with that kind of a production. Um, but what you were saying about Bob Ezrin, you know, always having that sort of an influence on the things he produced. Um, he did, you know, on, on a lot of things, like especially Pink Floyd, The Wall. I mean, you know, that has also a very cinematic um, quality to it. But uh, I, I don't think he, I mean, he really, uh, with the, the Alice Cooper, Love It to Death, I think he, he made that pretty solid. Yeah. You know, that, was, that, that was a good, more of a basic uh, production on that. Um, sounds great. Um, I'm not sure how much he had to do with <clears throat> any of the writing or um, arrangement of that, but that's an album that he did that doesn't have quite that same, you know, bombastic you know, cinematic thing. And also, I guess in the 80s, he did another album I liked a lot by Hanoi Rocks, Two Steps from the Move. He uh, he really got them dialed in pretty good. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure if the, I, I guess it was Bob Ezrin's call on that album. I'm not sure how that came about. But uh, to me, I think that's one of the drawbacks of Destroyer. It's just... I mean, I think it was definitely a risky move at the time, too, especially coming off such a raw, you know, like you said, bombastic album of Alive to go into such a, a cinematic approach to Destroyer. I mean, that was, I, I mean, it's been discussed at length. I don't think anybody really saw that type of an album coming at first. And I know at first it really wasn't, you know, received well. We all know the story of how Beth saved it, every, you know, everything. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever really, you know, grown tired of it or, you know, found it any different than I did back when I was a kid, I guess. But. I don't know. It's Destroyer for what it's worth. <laughs> so. I got away from it for, for a period of time. When I was a kid, I really liked it. And then uh, as a teenager, I sort of got away from it. And then I gravitate when I did listen to Kiss, I gravitated more to like Kiss Alive and Hotter Than Hell, uh, Rock sure. and Roll Over. 
Uh, more recently, I've, I've gotten into, I think you and I were talking about, we have a second pressing, second original mm -hmm. pressing that just sounds yeah. amazing. Way better. Yeah, so, yeah. so through listening to that, I've, I've, I've been getting into it a lot more probably in the last five years or so. so. <laughs> All right, what do you got for your number three pick, Darren? Uh, well, I was going to go with Dress to Kill and uh, Love Her All I Can was my pick, but uh, since Mike said that, and we talked about that a little bit. I'm going to go with Getaway. I think that's a pretty cool tune. Another one of those. Peter Chris sings that, and uh, it's cool. I mean, I like his raspy voice. It's got it's kind of an up-tempo song. Um, you know, by the time I got dressed to kill, I had heard the songs a lot, but at least half the album on Kiss Alive. So um, I looked forward to hearing the songs that I hadn't heard yet. And Getaway was one of those songs, and I liked it. And it's always kind of stuck with me. So that's that's my deep cut pick. Cool. Just to kill. All right. Number three for me, we'll stick with uh, Dress to Kill. Anything for my baby. Oh. Ah, good one. I think it's interesting. Early Kiss, to me, has an element to them that's very, makes me think of like classic rock and roll and what i mean by that is like 50s 60s rock and that song kind of has a you got to do kind of thing from you know kind of sing along uh type of thing maybe a little bit of a pre precursor to rock and roll all night or some shouted out loud the more sing songy type of things and that, that they did later on it's it's a simple song again that's what maybe makes me think it's sort of like could have been a Buddy Holly song uh, or something, you know, it's, it has that kind of simple, just rock and roll feel to it. And, and in the early days of Kiss, they, they really had an element of that, which was just kind of straight old fashioned uh, rock and roll. Yeah, I think Kiss is uh, our generation's Beatles. Some people would probably get pissed off hearing me say that, <laughs> especially <laughs> Beatles fans, loyal Beatles fans, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of pomp and uh, and glory applied to the Beatles, and, and I get that. But my generation, and I think musicians that are of our age that grew up, you know, their first exposure, that first plateau, as I like to call it, of Kiss, I, I think they were just as influential to my generation as the generation before were influenced by the Beatles. Um, and, and Kiss did have a very uh, rock and roll, classic rock, you know, 50s rock sensibility. That's what made the song so great. I mean, they follow that template, you know, they're catchy, uh, well, well arranged, not, not busy, you know, not, not overindulgent, got to the point pretty quick. I think most of the albums, the first three albums were like 30 minutes, you know, in their entirety. Uh, rock and Roll All Night was on Dress to Kill. So, yeah, yeah you're right. So it wasn't um, right now. Yeah, I mean, that, that vibe is kind of all throughout the album, almost a little bit of Motown in a way, like anything from my baby kind of has that, yeah. you know, that kind of a vibe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first and foremost, they were, they were a band that, uh, you know, wrote good songs. And then I think everything else came after that. But uh, with a lot of bands that maybe have the, you know, shock rock or that theatrical thing going on, um, Kiss, I always thought had the music to back it up. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think if they, if they didn't have the songs they had, I, I don't think they would have. I don't think we'd be talking about them right yeah, now. Yeah, the makeup would have only <laughs> carried them so far. Yeah, yeah. There's, There's sure. a lot of things they had going for them. I think they weren't like the most talented musicians, but I mean they can all hold their own. Um, they didn't just get dressed up. I mean they took it out on stage. They became those characters. Paul Stanley, you know, he's he's a great front man. Um, I, I think one of the reasons that Kiss just uh, is so godlike, I guess, is because they just had it all going on. You know, the song, yeah. the command, the confidence, the look, everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they fired on all cylinders, that's for sure. All right, what do you got at number four? <sighs> Mike. Number four. Mike? Or, yeah, yeah, that's what we're on, right? I got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> the much maligned, misunderstood elder. So, 
I gotta go with the oath. Okay. I knew somebody was gonna pick this one. Yeah, it's to me it's the heaviest song yeah. on here. You know, and I know that you know when it was originally released, they moved that song up to be the, the lead off track, I think, just to draw people in. Fanfare, I think, is the original, you know, track listing. And you know, that would have thrown me for a loop too. But um when I saw them perform you know, songs from this on uh, the old Friday's TV show, I immediately kind of went back to check out The Elder because it was like, man, them songs sound so heavy live, you know, because I, like everybody else, kind of been like, yeah, okay, I don't know what's going on here for, for whatever reason. I'm not going to listen to it again. But once I heard those songs live and I went back and I really re-examined, you know, I, I really dug The Elder. It, it grew on me through the years, and I actually really – understood and appreciated that album a hell of a lot more probably just in the last maybe 10 years or so so i uh, actually frequently throw that one on it, it's it's a great album but the oath is just the heaviest song on there you know For sure out. and if the production had a little bit more teeth to it if the guitar had a, just a yeah. little bit more presence that i'd love to hear some some band you know, cover that song because it does that main riff you know, some of the demo versions that have floated around, you know, with the Elder, or even like the demo versions off of uh, the Killers, like the No Run and stuff, those demo versions were so much more heavy. And then they just, they lost that, you know, in the final production, they kind of glossed them over a little bit. So, yeah. you know, to me, it was a lot of what it could have been, but still, I, I like the Elder and I, and the Oath is freaking great. Yeah, great pick. All right, Darren, number four. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go with Flaming Youth. Can you see this in my kitchen and glare? Destroy it. We've already seen it all a bunch of times. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was always my. This is always my favorite song off of off of Destroyer. I always like the line, "My parents think I'm crazy, I'm crazy, and they hate <laughs> the things I do. I'm stupid and I'm lazy. And if they only knew, <laughs> flaming you could, could set the world on." <laughs> I dug that, man. I I, I could relate to that because I was stupid and lazy. Um, <laughs> still am, maybe more so. Uh, cool song. I like I like I like Paul's vocals. Uh, great rock song it's one of the songs on destroyer that isn't encumbered by that bob ezrin production thing that we were just talking about pretty solid straightforward yeah i still dig that song every time i hear it if it comes on random shuffle in my car i like to crank that shit up for some reason that song and and sort of that album in general have you ever seen that movie over the edge yeah it, it reminds, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's some Kiss songs, I think. Are there any Kiss songs in that movie? I don't remember. If there isn't, there's kids wearing Kiss shirts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sort of that whole like 70s, uh, you know, parents just don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, just vibe, I just think is, 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 uh, is great. You know, Kiss was real in the 70s. Kiss really, uh, the teenagers owned Kiss. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a kids teenagers thing and it, i just think it's just kiss always 70s era kiss just really reminds me of the 70s you know just yeah. it, it encapsulates that that sort of era for me by this time kids <clears throat> knew who their target audience was and they were playing to that audience oh yeah definitely with destroyer you know everything about it was you know definitely real stimulating to uh to kids the album cover songs shout it out loud let's get a party started yeah. all yeah. the things that were like you know definitely appealing to to that age group so. yeah all right number four for me i think as am i the first person to pick something from a solo album yes, yes no, you all right. are all right well of course in my opinion the best of the four solo albums uh the guy who rocked the hardest <laughs> and i pick I, I actually had another one picked off this but i at the last second before we started, I, I, I went with a snow blind okay. because it's just got a super cool uh, groove to it. <clears throat> and I love the verse, da 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 da, ba ba, da 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 da. And I love the part where it goes, feels like I'm lost in space, 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 space. <laughs> Ace does such a great job of like playing up that spaceman and it plays so well into, you know, of course he was a guy 
spaced out a lot of times. So sort of the <laughs> playing with the words and, 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 and the innuendos and everything. And the guitar just sounds freaking great on it. Uh, I just love, love this, this whole album. I just think it's just fantastic. And that particular, I almost went with Ozone. That was going to be my, That's my other pick one. from this, which is a really cool one. But I went with Snow Blind just because I like the verses and just the whole, the whole vibe, the whole thing is just rocking, man. It's just the whole album has just a lot of energy, energy to it that I just think is, it comes right, right out of the gate, you know, uh, rip it out and everything and just doesn't seem to let up for pretty much the whole, the whole record. So. I can remember asking my mom what snowblind meant and she said, oh, he was caught in a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Blowing so bad he can't see. I said, all right, cool, mom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think the thing about the Ace Freely solo album was that I think it took people off guard. Nobody really knew what to expect. You know, and of course, you know, Paul Stanley's solo album is going to sound like Kiss. Yeah. Gene Simmons is going to sound kind of like Kiss. Peter Chris, eh, you know, you'll get a little bit of that, you know, well, I think people were hoping we'd get a little bit of like Black Diamond or, yeah. you know, or a little yep. bit on the heavier side. But Ace only had, up to that point, shocked me. So no one was really, you know, like, wow, Ace, wow, he sings on the whole thing. I remember that was a question that I had. Um, and then when I got the album, put it on, I was just playing back. I mean, it was just so well written. The vocals were great, relatively speaking, very confident. Um, yeah, I mean, it was solid. And, and it kind of took the whole Kiss thing because it was all Ace, all Ace's voice. Um, more of the, uh, I'm going to say, although maybe it didn't apply so much at the time, but in retrospect, it kind of had that stoner rock aspect of Kiss that I think Ace brought to the band. Yeah. That was in spades on his solo album. So it was pretty cool. It still is cool. Definitely. Uh, I'm not sure it's my favorite solo album. Um, but it was for a long time. I think more recently I've been uh, gravitating more towards Paul's. But yeah, that, that Ace album's Ace. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We are number five. <laughs> Halfway there. Uh, let's visit Rock and Roll Over. I was kind of jumping between either Mr. Speed, because that's a great, great yeah. song. But I'm going to have to go with Love Him and Leave Him simply for Gene, just because I love the way he rolls into his, his verses. Out, so you give me your number. <laughs> You'll see me tonight. Hi. You know, that whole, that whole thing. It's just, it's, just, it's a great chorus. And it's just a great, you know, rocking tune. And it's just those, you know, typical Kiss lyrics that were coming up at that time. Yeah. But why that song to me didn't get uh, played live was another one. I know they made the promo video for it where they kind of lip sync to it and everything, but that, that's one that uh, I think should have made the live set for sure. So love them, leave them. Cool. All right, Darren, what do you got for number five? Yeah, Rock and Roll Over is my favorite Kiss album. Uh, it was the first one that I got, but I don't think that's so much the reason. I, I, just, I just love everything about it. I think the songs are great. I love the production. I think Eddie, Eddie Kramer just dialed that in perfectly. I think it really uh, it is the, the best production that, that uh, puts Kiss's music where it, where it should be uh, as far as just the overall quality. So I'm going to also... Uh, take a pick from rock and roll over and I'm going to go with Mr. Speed. Uh, I love that lick in the beginning and it, it has like, I never realized it at the time. Well, I always liked the song when I was a kid. I always thought that was really cool. It's, you know, the, the guitar riff, the guitar lick is really cool. And I know Kathy and I were talking about, you know, she's like, well, what, 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 what songs are you going to pick? She's a huge Kiss fan, as you guys know. Um, she's like, well, you got to say Mr. Speed. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> don't want to upset the wife. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, be sleeping yeah. on, you'll be sleeping on the sofa tonight if you don't pick that one. <laughs> no, so that's the only reason. No, no, I mean, it's also <laughs> my favorite, too. So we kind of like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, of course, Mr. Speed. Uh, what's interesting about that is that's, uh, with Kiss's music, I could never really, uh, I mean, I could hear certain influences of different things. 
uh, kind of vaguely, not really, uh, not really directly, but on Mr. Speed, I, I can definitely hear a T-Rex vibe on that. It's probably mm. one of the only Kiss songs I can, I can say that I really, they, they really bit off of another band's music. So definitely hear that, that, that T-Rex vibe, um, which I think is cool because it takes Kiss out of that, out of their little vacuum that, you know, when we were, you know, when I was a kid, one of the things that I like, one of the stories I like to tell, I think I told this to Mike, uh, when I was a kid, I went to the record store with my dad and he, he said, you know, go ahead, get a record. And I looked around and I said, nope, I got them all. I said, what do you mean you got them all? There's like hundreds of records here. I said, no, I got all the kids records. I got, all, I got all the records I want. I don't want any more records. So my whole world was rock and roll, rock music was all about Kiss. Um, you know, so, and as, as time went on, probably about a year or so later, I started to branch out, you know, and, and get more inquisitive about other, other bands. And by 78, sure. I was buying Black Sabbath. But, uh, you know, as a kid listening to Kiss, that, that's all there is, is just Kiss's music. Um, so it's interesting that uh, they were actually incorporating some other influences, contemporary influences, T-Rex being one of them, obviously. Yeah. Nice. That was uh, going to be one of my audible extra picks, just in case somebody had picked Baby Driver. I was going to go with Mr. Steve. My second pick. <laughs> All right. Uh, number five from Love Gun, Almost Human. Another Gene one for me. I love the groove in it. Interestingly, that little bass thing that he does in that too, -da -da, is the exact same notes as in uh, Larger Than Life. That little boo -doo -doo, it's the exact same thing. The song's <laughs> in the same key, the notes, the notes are the same. So it's just a fun one. It's another, another Gene one. He's sort of singing in more of his uh, demon style voice. Uh, moon comes out at night, he's a werewolf, whatever, hunting humans. Uh, Fun song. I like the guitar solo in it. It's got sort of it's like sort of this weird, noisy, backward sounds and different uh, guitars coming in. So, yeah, almost human. That's a good, good cool. pick. I like that song. All right, we're on number six. All right, let's go down the dynasty road. Um, I don't know. Darren and I have talked about this before, and I still say it to this day. I mean, you can take Dynasty for what it's worth. Has it aged well? Yeah, I guess it has. But to me, personally, the Ace songs have always carried this album and kind of saved this album. So my deep cut off of Dynasty is Hard Times. Um, I think it's a fantastic Ace song that could have easily maybe made the cutting room floor on the solo album. I don't know. But what intrigued me the most about it is, um, you know, I had read in one of the, I don't know, 16 magazine circus, that, you know, it was pretty much an autobiographical song. So, you know, me as a kid, I'm like, holy cow, this is all about Ace. He's telling his story. You know, none of these other guys have really said anything. And the mystique was still all in place. We didn't know who they were, you know, what they did or anything. So I was like, wow, look, at Ace is actually telling us all about it. And, you know, he used to go to the park with his friends and space out. You know, you read through the lyrics and it was just... To me, I was like, oh, my God, I know Ace personally now, you know, it's <laughs> so good. But just think, it, you know, the composition of the song, too, and the guitars, na -na 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 -na, you know, and the production on those songs really floored me. So even though there was a lot of shortcomings to Dynasty that, that I found at that age, um, I dove headfirst into the Ace songs, and I love them. So Hard Times is my favorite off that album. Yeah, nice. All right, Darren, number six. Love Gun. I'm going to go with Tomorrow and Tonight. You actually <laughs> took my, my first pick, Almost Human. Uh, but it was actually kind of a close tie between that and Tomorrow and Tonight. Tomorrow and Tonight was a song that I always would play over and over again off of Love Gun. Uh, kind of a sassy good rock song. Uh, good way to end side one. And uh, a lot of songs on this album that kind of have kind of approach that we're continuing that cartoonish um, kind of vibe. Almost Human's one of them. Plaster Caster, I never knew what that was about until sometime later. Um, <laughs> I almost wish I didn't. 
uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff on 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 Love Gun that is just really superficial. Um, and tomorrow and tonight isn't any different. But I, I guess what's uh, what's cool about it is it kind of has that shouted out loud rock and roll all night sort of like you know let's just have a good time it's, it's a good time song and um uh, i think it's a little more real than some of the other songs on love gun so i was i was gonna say it always felt like shouted out loud part two yeah yeah to me it's just the same kind of hey everybody can you fight for your right to party you know that kind of and we always you got to do that you know <laughs> At least once a week, I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and another song that's, you know, just represents that whole 70s it's a good rock and roll night party every day, you know, vibe. So, cool. The cool thing about these records is, man, it's like a time capsule in the, in the 70s. I mean, there wasn't, for a teenager, which is, you know, the, the target audience for Kiss at this point, there wasn't much to do or wasn't much involved with life other than, like, getting drunk or stoned or driving around or cruising places and just hanging out and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was definitely, these records are sort of like a time capsule to simpler times before things started getting really complicated with technology and, and whatnot. The only technology there really was was probably like a hi-fi stereo or, you know, something like that. But, you know, just, uh, all these records kind of remind me of, of simpler times and kind of a better better vibe musically for sure well said darren yeah all right number six for me another solo album uh pick paul stanley solo album you know before we as i was getting ready for this deep cuts episode <clears throat> i went back and revisited i hadn't listened to paul stanley's album and just ages and somewhere in my mind I had just written off that it, Ace is the only good solo album but listening to this it, it really made me realize that it was a lot better than than I remembered it and it also made me realize how much of Kiss is Paul Stanley in his his songwriting uh, because this sounds like a Kiss album <laughs> yep. in, in a lot of ways any of these songs could have landed up on on the Kiss albums. And uh, the song I went with is Take Me Away Together As One, which is the, it's a ballad. And I, I like Paul in a ballad type setting like this, kind of a slightly darker style ballad. I think he puts in a great performance. I think he sounds great on the whole record. I also love uh, Car Carmine Apice plays drums yeah. on that one. The only song he plays drums on this. Right. And if you listen to the fade out of the song, every like cycle around, he does these like yeah. doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah. fills. And it sounds like they turned his drums up. Every time those fills come up, it's like they turn the drums up really yeah. loud. And it just sounds awesome. The drums are super heavy on it. And yeah. I just think Paul has a, has a great, great performance on it and it just kind of an emotional and Paul always struck me as the the uh, the emotional one in the group the romantic one in the group the guy Gene's sort of the cold businessman but Paul's more the heartfelt uh, kind of guy and that's kind of the vibe that that I got from a lot of his solo album and, and this one yeah um you know you're right uh he definitely like it he just he goes all in on that song when you know he got, when, it, when that chorus hits big i mean you can it just sounds like he's putting his whole, whole heart and soul into it in fact there's another band um uh i won't mention the name of the band but they recently did a cover version of it and uh that's what people were talking about and saying how great it was and i thought the vocals on the cover version uh, were just really flat and just missed the point. Um, you know, when, when Paul sings his song, I mean, like he, he's all in on it. And the cover version that, that was floating around, I probably still is. Uh, do you know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about, Mike? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shall I remain uh, nameless? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's actually a woman singing the song, and it's just like, it's just so flat. Like, why even do the song if you're not going to hone in on that emotional aspect of it? Because, I mean, yeah. that's like the main thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're right, John. It, he definitely goes all in. And it is one of the four solo albums, probably maybe the only 
solo album that sounds like it could be a Kiss album, you know. It, it would be curious that there wouldn't be any songs sung by Gene, but if you were to take that Paul Stanley solo album, put Kiss on the front of it, and call it something, yeah, it, it, it could have passed for a Kiss album. So I mean, it just shows you who the primary, you know, Paul was pretty much the, uh, pretty much the heart of Kiss, I think. Yeah. yeah. So almost right. redundant for him to do a solo album, really. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're at number seven. All right. I will keep the Paul Stanley love going. <laughs> um, and pretty much, you know, reiterating what you guys said, um, it took me a little bit of time to warm up to this, but through the years, yeah, this is definitely a Kiss record without without question. I, I always thought that Ace's album was more of an extension of where he started with Shock Me. You know, it still had its own unique identity to it. And I'm not taking anything away from the Paul album. I mean, this this is the essence of Kiss without without question. But um, the song I'm going with is Wouldn't You Like to Know Me? Cool. Simply because he, the emotion overload in that song, he, I mean, there's that rawness tone to his voice on that song particular to me, where you can see he's, you know, he's really going for it. He's trying to convey a message with that. And I just love the ebb and flow of that, that song. So, I mean, we've, we've said quite a bit about it, but yeah, I mean, this, this album is definitely, you know, right up there with the ace as far as the solo records go. But wouldn't she like to know me? It's my deep cut from the Paul Stanley solo album. Nice, nice. All right, Darren, number, what are we on here? Seven. Yep. More Paul love. Stanley. Might as well get Paul out of the way. Uh, <laughs> rather than come back to it. Uh, love and Chains is my pick off of this album. I always like that tune. Um, keep your love in chains. Uh, typical Paul Stanley, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know what he was singing about, but it was something like, you know, keeping it, keeping your love. Just a love. In chains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get to it because it was all chained up, I guess. I don't know. Uh, that was the song I gravitated towards first. I mean, I liked every song. I still do like every song on this album, but the song that gravi I gravitated to initially was Love and Chains because it sounded most like a Kiss song. Um, and it's cool. Right on. All right, number seven for me, <clears throat> from Hotter Than Hell, Going Blind. I love the bass in it. The bass almost has like a little bit of a lead type of thing in it. And I just love the, the melody line in it. The chord progression is kind of, kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard the Melvins did a version of it that was, uh, they stuck pretty close to that's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah to, what, to what it was. It's, it's a heavy, it's a dark song. Uh, on Houdini. Yeah, I'm, I'm 93, you're 16. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just great. So it's a cool song. Uh, I love Gene's bass playing on that. And just love the, the vibe of it, the way it ends. Bought up, bought up. <laughs> so that's my number seven. All right, we're we're turning a corner here. Number eight. All right, well, we've given Paul a lot of love, but I'm not exactly ready to go down the solo route for this one. So I'm gonna give some Peter some love. And I gotta say, I love Hooligan. Hooligan, oh. cool. All right. Just, <laughs> I always laughed at the lyrics of this song. You know, oh I always God. thought they were, What's that? That of, you don't make any sense. Dropped out of school when I was 22. Is that what you said? <laughs> can I do to satisfy you? <laughs> wow. What school was he going to when he was 22? He got a 55 Chevy. He was getting his doctorate, okay? I don't even know my name. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Peter was getting his doctorate. That's why he dropped out at 22. No, he wasn't. <laughs> he was not anywhere near a doctorate. <laughs> I'm a hooligan. Um... It's just, it's just a cool, it's a fun song. I love Peter, you know, he's the reason I started to play drums. So I, I always gravitated to see what Peter was doing on the album. It's a fun song. I love watching this song performed live on like those old Houston 77 yeah. shows. And mm -hmm. you can tell Peter's just so happy to be playing his song and he's just he rocking he did. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, especially when he goes into like the closing parts and Ace is soloing and he's 
just rocking it out. So yeah. But yeah, yeah Hooligan's a rocker, man. I love that song. Hooligan's cool. Hooligan's yep. cool for sure. Nice. All right. Number eight, Darren. All right. So I'm gonna stick with the solo albums. I'm gonna go with jeans. Um I don't have to get it. I always get a glare from it anyway. Um, Always <laughs> Near You is my pick from, from Gene's solo album. Uh, I was never really a big fan of Gene's solo album. The uh, order for solo albums for me, it would alternate between Paul and Ace. Um, and then the other two, I don't know, they were almost kind of disqualified. Uh, Peter, most definitely. <laughs> Gene, I, I kind of... <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it, it's, it's awful. And, and I revisited it recently for this purpose, and I thought, you know, there's got to be some redeeming value to this album. <laughs> there isn't. It's just horrible. Yeah, it's awful. Um, but anyways, but re-examining Gene's album, I think a couple years ago, um, I started really giving it uh, a closer listen, and, and I liked it, it um, so many years later, but uh, there's a real Beatles-esque vibe throughout. You, you could tell that, uh, that I think uh, a lot of that Beatles influence, where it can be found in Kiss's songs, I think largely came from Gene. I think Paul was more, more of a Led Zeppelin kind of dude, you know, more of like the a uh, uh, little bit heavier side, more guitar driven uh, aspect, I think was Paul's contribution along with Ace. But as far as the complete songs, I think that that came from Paul after. And, and these solo albums are cool because you can hear, uh, you know, each member's background and, and what their influence is. And you can kind of hear how it all blends together. With Gene, I, I definitely hear um, hear a Beatles vibe throughout most of the album, but especially on Always Near You. And I like the Beatles a lot, and I know you guys do too. Um, but that song just sounded like just a really good song. I don't know if it would have fit on the Kiss, the Kiss album per se, but as far as like the purpose of a solo album is doing something that maybe you wouldn't be permitted to do or maybe wouldn't quite fit on you know the band's album, I think that song fits perfectly in a solo album context. That's a good song. So that's my pick. That is a good song. You know, and, and Gene's album too. It, it, it's all. It's always sounded a little cluttered to me because it was very obvious he was trying to jam as much into that single album as he could. And, you know, yeah. he had Bob Seger and Cher. You know, everybody he could pull to play on that album. But it's. It's. I'm glad you brought it up because I almost picked Man of a Thousand Faces. It didn't make my list, but it was. It was right there. And I, I love that song too for a lot of the same reasons, you know, that one. So yeah, there's a lot to be said about about Gene's album, and it's I've come around to that quite a bit over the last few years. You're right. He does try to cram a lot into it. He he kind of goes with his persona on um, radioactive, especially that intro. The intro yeah. was so cool. It's like I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, oh man, this is this is gonna be gonna killer. Blow my mind, yeah. And then radioactive. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, kind of it out, and it's like, oh man. That cool. it's like, what? All right, song, but I mean, for for the intro to you know, you know the, how cool that intro is, and then it kind of goes, dun, 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 and then just sort of trails off into like kind of a, just your basic rock and roll song. Yeah, but but he does kind of try to like you know capitalize on his persona, Man of a Thousand Faces. I think he said that was like a tribute to Lon Chaney or yep. something. Yep. Uh, Tunnel of Love is pretty cool. Um, uh, but then he gets into this weird thing with when you wish upon a star. I, I never could quite figure that out. That's just a waste of time. Um, and then he redo the the the, re, uh, the redo of uh, was it see see when your dream. Yeah. You know that that was unnecessary. And in the original version or the the first version on uh, rock and roll over was mm -hmm. far superior anyway. Yeah, see when your dreams. Uh, I don't know why that's on there, Mister. I Mason. never understood that either. Yeah. And I've never heard a good explanation of why it was on there either. No, yeah. but uh, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of things going on in that album, but you know, some songs stand out as just pretty sincere. A lot of it maybe isn't quite as sincere, but there's about two or three songs I think are really, really good. Yeah. Cool. All right, number eight. I'm gonna stick with Gene. <laughs> and I am going to say, I know it's an odd pick, but 
and you guys pa apparently don't like it, but see you in my dreams. I <laughs> like the version on this. I think it has a motown -y vibe to it. And I know oh, Gene has doubt. talked about Motown. Mm. In fact, there's a great uh, video of Gene getting a bass lesson from Carol Kay. Carol Kay was somebody who played on like oh, yeah. thousands yeah. of like Motown songs. Yeah. And to me, the version on here feels like that. It, it's got the girl background singers. They're moving between see you, see you, feel you. And it swings a, a little bit better. To me, it just has more of an old timey Motown-y uh, swing vibe to it that I just really like. And the Gene solo album has got to be my biggest disappointment in the solo albums because as a kid, I was like, man, Gene, God of Thunder. This is, he's going to have the heaviest record out of everybody. And yeah. I did not come back to this for forever. And yeah. even now for this show, I went back and listened to it. There's still a lot of stuff that I don't like on it, but uh, I don't know. I just, I thought that was fun. I don't know who was playing drums on that particular song. I know he had a million studio musicians, yeah. but I think it just sort of swings. And with the background singers, it's produced a little bit more than uh, the rock and roll, which I like the rock and roll over version, but I, I just think it, and it is bizarre that he would put it on there. Uh, but yeah, I just think it's, uh, I cool. just think it's fun. Well, I think I it's different I enough. For, I, I think it's different enough where it, it does kind of warrant, you know, I mean, it isn't like he just did everything the same way as the rock and roll over version, you know, and he did kind of tweak it. And, and I guess the reason he put it on there was because he wanted it to sound a little bit different. He had a different vision for it than, yep. you know, when it came, when it, when it all got put together for rock and roll over and everybody, you know, weighed in on it and it kind of maybe a change from his original vision of the song. And maybe this is his original vision. Um, I don't like it as much, but, you know, I guess it serves a purpose because it is different enough. Yeah. All right. Number nine. All right. Peter Chris is gone. Enter Eric Carr. So got to bring up the Creatures album. And I mean, the first thing that comes to anybody's mind, I guess, to me, is just the, the bombastic, thunderous drum production on this album. Yeah. And uh, my deep cut, because I mean, if later on, I mean, they started playing quite a few off of this one too, but uh, Saint and Sinner mm. is such a great song. Just the way it starts off and then the, you know, the way the drums roll into that and just locks you into that groove that, you know, um, that it was just a standout track, you know, and it's especially coming right after the title track, Creatures of the Night, just pulls right into that. I just remember being absolutely blown away by this record. You know, such a return to form, albeit too late, but Saint and Sinner is a monster song on a huge. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I love that whole record. And I had mentioned, uh, well, in our group text before uh, me and Darren were going back and forth, and I said, if Kiss had released that album in 1980, 1980, when all those great albums dropped, Blizzard of Oz, Heaven and Hell, Oh, yeah. Everybody seemed to, uh, uh, British Steel, everybody seemed to know like, okay, there was just this shift in the consciousness of metal at that time. And, and Kiss was just sort of, Creatures of the Night should have came in 1980. I think it would have set a different tone. Oh, there's no question. There's uh, no question. So that would have fit perfectly slotted right there in, in 1980. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think in some ways, a lot of what was going on in heavy rock was kind of a reaction to Kiss, Kiss's music and, and, and the influence that Kiss had in mainstream music culture. Um, you know, I, we were young, so we got, we went all in on Kiss. Uh, we, we were at the target age, I think, for Kiss to have maximum appeal, but I think people that were older than us probably weren't that into it. They just thought it was a lot of like, kind of crappy, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I guess I can kind of get that in a way. Um, but I think that some of what was going on with the heavy metal, you know, with the new wave of British heavy metal was more of like a back to basics, almost sort of, well, but definitely a, a more of a D, DIY, um, no no big budget type of, a, of an affair, more about, you know, back to the roots, um, you know, more, more rawness, more energy. I think Kiss, the, the, 
at that time had kind of like ran their course and, and and some of this was you know the up and coming hard rock heavy metal bands were sort of this was a reaction against the whole kiss thing you know and the bloated stadium rock state of mm -hmm. affairs that things gradually you know moved to you know the scene in 1979 1980 was a reaction against that so i think that but we also discussed uh that kiss was kind of isolated they were got so hugely popular in the in the mid to late 70s i i don't even think they considered anything that was going on around them i think they kind of lived in their own little bubble and uh, i think they were completely out of touch with what was going on so that's why they were sort of late to the game mm -hmm. you know? In that regard, they they had no idea what was going on. They were just kind of doing their thing and moving from album to album. And the whole cast of characters and studio musicians and managers and lawyers and God only knows what else. You know, it was just a huge thing that they were just completely engulfed in, and, and they there was no way that they could see anything outside of that. So, yeah, yeah. it was at a point too where they were churning out at some points, you know, two albums a year. It was just such a yeah. nonstop machine. So I, I think you're right. I think they were completely blind to the shift in music, you know, at the time and where they could have capitalized on fitting in and rolling with that. I mean, I'll, I'm going to go off of what you said, John, I'll go so far as to say had creatures come out in 1980 and capitalized on, you know, the renewed heaviness, you know, the renewed interest in, in metal, you know, they, they might have stuck it out a couple more years with makeup on and everything. I agree. It, it completely would have that, shifted yeah. their direction. <clears throat> it would have fit the mood of 1980 and little, maybe yes. if they had, well, they did slightly adjust the makeup uh, around that, around that era a little bit coming off of like the way they looked for uh, the, uh, the, elder the elder style makeup. They made it a little bit darker, yeah. a little bit heavier. And so well, I think they were, they were hung up on the idea of, pleasing the critics at that time too. I've, I've read all kinds of articles about that where, you know, I don't know if it was an identity crisis within the band, but I know that they were, you know, strategically trying to align themselves with putting out a record that, you know, they, they really wanted the accolades from the Rolling Stones and, and things like that. So, yeah. and it, it's just unfortunate that they didn't just follow along and see exactly what was happening and unfolding outside of that area. Otherwise, yeah, I, I completely agree with that synopsis, John. All right, cool. So, Darren, we are number nine. To continue with this conversation about, you know, what, what happened with KISS, um, you know, he, he, here's, here's a good example. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking at this time when I saw the album cover and everything, I thought, well, first of all, I, I heard or read in the magazine, you know, like I was buying a plate or a circus and I read that the album was going to be called unmasked and i thought they were going to take off their makeup not because i really wanted them to but because it was more of a curiosity thing everybody always wanted to know what they looked like underneath their makeup there's all this critique about it but of course they didn't take off the makeup and the album was basically disco um more or less uh we had some a songs so we kind of followed the formula a little bit from dynasty uh but i think there may be one or two more a songs i think they, they realized that after Ace's solo album, that Ace was getting pretty popular. It was a viable resource. Yeah. yeah. So he had he had more to contribute to this. Um, but uh, and I, I I didn't get this album when it came out. Uh, I had no time for Kiss at this point in time. After Dynasty, uh, which I was a little bit I, I liked it, you know. But by that time I had moved on. I was listening to to Black Sabbath and Van Halen and Alice Cooper. Rush, Ted Nugent, um, this album, Dynasty, wasn't, it, it wasn't what I was interested in. Um, but I, I liked it because I had already had like so much time invested in Kiss. But anyway, my, my pick is coming from Unmasked, which is an album that, like I said, I, I, I couldn't stand when I first heard it. But over time, I really warmed up to it. And in fact, I really warmed up to the, uh, the popish side of this album. And uh, my pick on this is what makes the world go round. It's by far the gayest song <laughs> on this album. But I, I don't mean that in like, you know, the homosexual gay or anything. So I don't want to offend anybody. I mean that in a, a G-E-Y way. Uh, it's, it's, it's gay. And uh, as most of the album is. But uh, 
it's it's really catchy <laughs> and uh it's a fun song and after a certain point when you know you got through you know you have all of kiss's records basically you know you're, you're looking back on the discography and you're picking like okay from 1974 to 76 kiss was pretty mean they were pretty wicked they were they were cool you know, that black and silver era they they were they were pretty pretty badass and then you know they went kind of hollywood around destroyer and kind of followed that through until you know double platinum they were just just this huge band stadium stadium band and then you know following that period they didn't really seem to know what they were doing they had a lot of outside songwriters um kind of confused uh trying to sell records trying to maintain their status i think not really knowing how to do that properly in a way that you know stayed consistent with the original plot so subsequently they lost the plot and uh but nevertheless you know um they could still write a good song even though i didn't really quite understand what they were trying to do years later i have a use for unmasked <laughs> and, uh, and I found out what makes the world go round. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right, my number nine from Creatures of the Night. I still love you. This might be one of my favorite Paul Stanley vocal performances of all time. Uh, I had already mentioned a Paul Stanley ballad from his solo album, Take Me Away. So this is kind of a similar vibe. It's a dark ballad, but man, Paul's delivery on this is just, it's, it's just, it sounds a shiver up my spine. It's so emotional. There's, there's this kind of a part where the song's going out where he just holds out this one really long note. It's, oh, it's, it's just great. So for me, the song, it's, it's, it's all about Paul. I love the sort of picked guitar, the way it builds. The production on Creatures of the Night sounds a little bit darker to me than, than yeah. especially what had come before with like Unmasked and stuff. So this fits that vibe. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's just a dark ballad. The drums, we already mentioned how the drums are just thunderous on this record and they really shine on this song because there's just so much open, open space on it. So yeah, number nine, I Still Love You from Creatures of the Night. That's a great pick, and I, I didn't really want to that song at first. I mean, I ended up liking it, but honest to God, it, it took me to the Kiss Unplugged to when they performed that. And then, it, for whatever reason, it really opened up my eyes. I was like, man, this is a killer song. So then I you know went back and listened to Creatures a few more times, and then I was really like, wow, what was I missing the first time with this song? <laughs> I don't know if I was just going for the straight heaviness of the album, and I didn't have time for that back at that point, but... Yeah, I mean, what a what a song. That's, that's a good pick. Yeah, it's pretty epic. Um, the thing about Creatures that uh, struck me was how heavy it was. For you know, it, it, it took me off guard. Oh yeah. Now and uh, so I was more preoccupied with with like really honing in on that vibe, like that that guitar riff in the song Killers and War Machine. Wow, yep. that blew me away. Title track, uh, I love it loud is cool. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of heaviness going on that uh, just all of a sudden it just kind of surprised everybody they came out with this album it was killer uh so i i you know didn't really focus too much on i still love you but um uh, there's no denying that the song caught my attention and mostly because it was just so epic and as mm -hmm. john describes i mean he goes all in he sells it you know he puts his heart and soul into it and he owned that song it is a good song all right, we're at our last picks. What do you got for your last pick, Mike? All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say with Dynasty, we lost a couple of lug nuts, but by the time we got to Unmasked, I think the wheels were really starting to fall off. <laughs> I'll say they probably, probably skid across the asphalt when it hit the elder, but they were pretty wobbly by this point. But um, yeah, kind of like what Darren said too. Um, Thank God the A song saved Dynasty for me because they did pretty much the exact same thing with Unmasked too. And I, I say that, you know, with, with all the, the love I've got for Ace, I just, I couldn't really pick anything really good out of this album other than that. So um, there was some corny stuff on here, Torpedo Girl. You know, I still laugh <laughs> yeah. when I listen to that song. It's just- Corny is a, corny is a better word to use than again. <laughs> corny, 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 it's, it's, it's all of the above. 
But uh, I gotta tell you, two sides of the coin just does it for me. I love that song. I just okay. I love the way it flows. I just I love the chorus and I love the little stutters in there, especially that last one coming out where it's that doo -doo -doo -doo, two sides of the coin. It's just it's a great, great song. And to me it's the shining the shining moment on an otherwise very dull, you know. You can polish a turd all you want, but it's still a turd. <laughs> so. That's right. You know, but I think the thing about Unmasked is, I mean, once you get past the whole thing that it's not, it's not a heavy rock album, really. Um, some good songs. I mean, there's some well-written songs. Easy as it seems, that's totally disco, but it's a, it's a, it's a good song. I mean, it, it yeah, it's all the mark. I'll say, I'll say I have warmed up to She's So European. I, I like that good. one. That's a pretty good song too. But Make I mean, Talk City to Me is a really good song, and I think that was actually a pretty you know fairly a big hit in germany for yeah that time and that's a great great song too but talk to me is probably my favorite a song i don't i don't have on this album i don't i don't have any there's no love for a torpedo girl i think it's horrible uh, <laughs> the coin is, is pretty cool uh you're all that i want is a waste of time they should have just left that off i think yep. they had the material at that point to just not even put that on there I'm, I'm not right sure it sucks uh easy as it seems the bongos the disco vibes and I just want to dance. Uh, is that You is actually a cover. And I think that was one of the more straightforward rockers on, on this album. If, if there is one, that would be it. Naked City, like I said, it's, it's, it's a cool tune. It's got a cool vibe. It's really a yeah. name for, for Kiss. I think that was really probably uh, due largely to some of the outside writing team that was involved with the, uh, the business force that was Kiss at that time. Shandy, sure. I love it. I hated it. I love it now. I don't know what it is. I, I still can't wrap my head around that one. It's okay for what it is, but. Yeah. Uh, She's So European is a fun song. Uh, very dated. Kind of has that, that keyboard thing going on mm -hmm. in it. Kind of dates it. Uh, what else is there? Tomorrow. You know, Tomorrow kind of sounds like it should have been on Billy Joel uh, Glass Houses. <laughs> <laughs> that, that vibe. Are you familiar with that album at all? Billy Joel's New Wave album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it kind of sounds like that. Anyway, is my last pick? Is it my turn? Yeah, number ten. Okay. Uh, so I'm going with the Elder. Uh, I don't. I didn't know what to think of this when it came out. It was so out of left field. And, and Nobody did. It. Yeah, and, and I and I didn't really give it a lot of time because it wasn't what I wanted to hear. It wasn't what I expected, and I just did. I I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to process any of it. So it took some time for me to wrap my head around it. Um, I had friends at that time that were diehard Kiss fans were warming up to it and trying to to get me to to check it out, and I I just wasn't interested. But years later, um, I I really started listening to it, and I and I like it a lot. Uh, so my song on this is Just a Boy. Love the lyrics. Um, they're great. And it kind of reminds me of something, uh, and, and who fans would probably, their heads would probably, yeah. it, it reminds me of something that might, you might find on, you might hear on Quadrophenia. Yeah. Um, it, it, I always it, think that when I hear that song, it makes me think of Tommy or Quadrophenia. Yeah. Or like it could have um, been a who. And I'm sure that was probably an influence, but I, I think that it, it kind of definitely it ties in with that. Uh, but I, I love the lyrics in that. It, it sounds very sincere. I think the lyrics are, are, are good. Um, they're not silly. It's kind of a departure for Kiss. And this album was, uh, obviously it was conceptual. Um, Lou Reed helped with this album too. I think he wrote A World Without Heroes. Yep. Uh, Mr. Blackwell, and I believe I. Um, the Oath is is like a, that's a great song. That, that's a real like, that, that's a metal song. That was probably ahead of its time. You know. When, when yeah. It's, but yeah, my pick, and I still when I when I listen to the Elder, I I really kind of like get swept away with uh, just a boy, and you know, in its context, the whole album I think is really cool. It's a good one to just kick back, listen to, and just kind of soak it all in. Just a boy. Yeah, nice. All right, my last pick. I'm going back to. I had to call a few audibles here because some other things got called. I'm going back to "Hotter Than Hell" and "Strange Ways," uh, which I believe Ace wrote it, but Peter sings it. 
you know, would have been interesting to hear Ace sing it, although you're so used to hearing <clears throat> Peter's voice on it. Uh, the production on this album is, is pretty simple, but that particular song, it almost has a little bit of a doomy uh, vibe to it, which I think is really cool. Uh, I think the guitar is, is great on it, and I just think it's a fun tune. So that's yeah. I think. I think a lot of people have been, um, people our age that are, are talking about Kiss, I remember, I, I think on uh, the, the forum that Mike and I have on Facebook, Vinyl Nation, some people have posted Hot in Hell and drew attention to Strange Ways. And it was one of those songs on Hot in Hell just, just kind of went right by me. But uh, more, more recently, I guess probably like in the last 10, 15 years, I started like really gravitating to that song too. And it does have kind of that uh, almost kind of doomy vibe to it. Yeah. Cool. I'm in that category too. I, I let it fly by my by me too, but you know, as it circles back around, and you know, when you widen your, your spectrum of listening too and you get more influences and you come back to that, I think it absolutely kind of fits in with, you know, the, the plotting heaviness of, you know, quote unquote a lot of the doom stuff too. So it's yeah, that's a great song. Love that song. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Those are our 10 favorite deep cuts from the makeup era of KISS. Let us know what you think in the comments. Let us know what some of your deep cuts are from that era. So I'd like to thank Darren and Mike for coming out and doing this with me today. It was, as usual, a great blast. I have, I have a feeling uh, we'll be seeing these guys again back on the show because we have a nice chemistry here. And uh, Till we see you next time, remember to stay heavy, stay metal. Thanks guys.